Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church, and glad you have joined us to worship today. Uh, Steve was playing uh, Behold Our God, and uh, what a, a beautiful song that we've been singing. In Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3, it says this, Blessed be the God of and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Let's pray. Father, as we gather here today in your house, I pray that you will open our hearts and our minds to the music and the message. I pray, Lord, that we will be focused on you, focused on how gracious and loving and good that you are. I pray, Lord, that we will apply the song, the message, and the teachings today, Lord, and that we will walk out of this building today equipped and prepared to be your servants this coming week. Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus Christ, for the blood that was shed on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that that blood was shed for us, that we may have a relationship with you. In your son's precious name we pray, amen. Good morning. We're here to worship the Lord today, amen? Amen. Stand with us as we sing. Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
We just want to take a moment to say thank you for your tithes and gifts and offerings that you give. And just as a reminder, the, there is the online uh, ability for you to give. And there's the offering box at the, in the back in the hallway at the back of the sanctuary that you may uh, give your tithes and gifts as well. Let's pray. Fathers, we come before you during this offertory time. We just say thank you for the gifts and tithes and offerings that uh, you give to us so that we may give back to you. Father, we thank you that the uh, monies that are given are used in our church for the ministries, and you allow these ministries to continue, Lord. Lord, we just say thank you for how you blessed us financially, how you've blessed us with gifts and talents. And I pray, Lord, that we will be uh, faithful to you to use those gifts and talents and finances to continue your work and further your ministry. In your name we pray. Amen. This is our song of the month. What a wonderful message. Love this song. We're here to worship the Lord. And we can worship him knowing that he is right here in our midst. Amen. I believe that he's here. We just need to behold him. Let's look to him and give him our worship today. Stand if you're able to as we sing, Behold Our God.
Good morning. Scripture reading this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 26. Verse 12 reads, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, 
that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our, unrep our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we ask for your help as we come to your word, that you would open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your law, that you would grant us the grace to be able to behold you in your scriptures, that we might be changed by them, that we might glorify you in the process. May Jesus Christ be exalted in our worship through the preaching and attention to the word this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, I mentioned last week that we have an exciting Sunday approaching here at First Baptist. I'm calling it Vision Sunday. It's a time where we gather to worship and to hear preaching from the Word of God as we do each and every week. But we're also going to be talking about where we're going as a church. You see, in two weeks, on June 6th, we will be gathering together for one worship service at 10 a.m., and since it's going to be a little bit more full in here than normal, we will also be streaming to the Fellowship Hall in case you would like to be down there where you can spread out a little bit more than you can up here. We will be still be having Sunday school groups that day, but they'll be starting at 9 o'clock instead of 9.30, so we have enough time to be able to have uh, Sunday school that, that hour and then dismiss in time to get back up here in time for the worship gathering at 10 a.m., and with Vision Sunday approaching, we're taking some time to look at different passages that give us an idea of our place in the church. If you will, we're setting the table for Vision Sunday. There are some foundational truths that we need to see in the Word of God and some foundational realities that will help us understand what God is calling us to do next as a church. So last week, we looked at the role of pastors and the responsibility to equip believers to do the work of the ministry. God has a lot for us to do as a church. And so he gave us pastors to equip us to carry out that mission. Now, when we were talking about pastors and their role last week, we began to touch on the role of believers in general. Another foundational reality that we need to consider is the role of each individual member and how we fit into the picture of God's plan for the church. How do we contribute to the mission that God has given to the church? Maybe you're wondering that today. You shuffled in here this morning wondering whether it's important if you stay connected to our church. You aren't sure if it really matters if you stick around or slowly disappear from the picture. You don't know if you add any value to this body of believers. Maybe you're discouraged this morning because you aren't sure if God can use you. You don't feel like you have any skills or abilities that matter to God 
or to others. Well, the passage we're going to be looking at this morning addresses these feelings. In fact, it's going to help us see a couple different mindsets that are potential sicknesses in our church, the body of Christ. So if you haven't already, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and turn there so that we can begin reading together in verse 12 in just a moment. We're going to see an introductory truth beginning in verse 12 that will help set the table for the rest of the message this morning. So I'm going to begin reading where Paul starts this section with verse 12 of chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So Paul begins this portion of Scripture by making a comparison. He's linking together two different concepts by proving a commonality that they share in these two verses. He starts by saying, just as the body. So his first object being compared is the human body. And if you look at the end of that verse, which is the other end of the object of comparison, he says, so it is with Christ. So Paul is going to be making some kind of connection between the nature of the human body and the nature of Christ. So what is true about the human body that is similar to Christ? Paul says the body is one and has many members. And then in essence, he says the same thing in a different way by saying, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. Now the word translated members here could actually also be translated limbs and organs, if you want to be more specific here. So Paul is saying that our limbs and our organs, though very different and varied, are all still parts of one body. You know, we don't talk about our leg body or our nose body or our liver body. No, those are all parts of my one body. But how is this the case with Christ? What are his limbs and organs that make up one unified body? Well, Paul explains the comparison in verse 13. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So the spirit that Paul is referring to here is the Holy Spirit. He says that we have all been baptized by the Spirit into one body. So folks, let me ask you a question. Who is the we that he's talking about here? Well, in this letter, Paul is writing to the believers who make up the Corinthian church. So specifically, he's talking about the Corinthian believers. But in general, he's talking about all believers. He's talking about you, and he's talking about me. Now also, what does Paul mean when he says we were all baptized into one body? Is he talking about water baptism? We're Baptists here. We like to talk about water baptism. Is he referring to that time when we were immersed in the water and we testified to the church and to the world? That we've trusted in Jesus as our Savior? We know that this is not the case because Paul was not baptized before the church at Corinth. In fact, he was never a member of the church at Corinth. Also, Paul says that they had all experienced this baptism by the Spirit. So this isn't water baptism, which is a public testimony of identification with Christ after salvation. Instead, this is spirit baptism, which is when the Holy Spirit unites a believer to the body of Christ immediately at the time of his or her salvation. The Spirit of God immerses us into the body of Christ right at the moment that we first believed the gospel message. 
So Paul is saying here that we were all baptized by the same Spirit of God who united us as limbs and organs of one body. Christ's body. Now he goes on to clarify that it doesn't matter if we're Jews or Gentiles, whether we're slaves or we're free people. In other words, our ethnicity and our social backgrounds don't matter. We have all been baptized by the same Spirit into the same body, Christ's body. Now, Paul also tells us that we were all made to drink of one Spirit. And I ask you, what does that mean? Well, to drink here literally means to drink our fill. I mean, this is not just a sip. This is to be drenched or saturated. And by the context, we can see that Paul is trying to make it clear to us that we've all experienced the same benefit of the Holy Spirit at the time of our salvation. Paul is saying, you were all saturated. You were drenched with the Holy Spirit. Some of you didn't receive a little more of the Spirit than others. The slaves didn't only receive half baptism, while free men received full baptism. The Jews didn't receive special advanced status in their baptism that Gentiles missed out on. Every single believer was privileged with complete union with the body of Christ. And every believer has received the same indwelling Holy Spirit. So why does Paul feel compelled to convince the Corinthian believers of this fact? Why is it important that we just spend a few minutes figuring out what Paul just said there? Well, it becomes very evident quickly in the next several verses that the people in this particular church were experiencing a couple of different major problems. And we're going to see two ailments or two sicknesses that plagued the local body of Christ at Corinth that we also are susceptible here in modern day First Baptist Church of Effingham. See, we're going to see the first sickness in verse 14 through 20 and the second sickness in verses 21 through 26. And we want to look at these carefully and ask God, is this something that we might fall into if we're not careful? So let's look at the first sickness starting in verse 14. Paul writes, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not of an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less part of the body. So the first sickness that we see in this body is feelings of uselessness. Now notice how Paul reminds the Corinthian believers that the body is made up of many kinds of limbs and organs in verse 14. Then he goes on to give a hypothetical situation here that is one of the most humorous illustrations that Paul uses in the Bible. This is Paul's version of humor right here. He gives the example of a foot looking at the glories of the human hand and how the hand has the privilege of shaking other hands of different people. And how the hand gets to write or to type on a keyboard in order to communicate with other humans. And the hand gets to make the winning shot in a basketball game. Or swing the bat that hits the walk-off home run in a baseball game. And the foot says, how awesome and useful the hand is. He gets all the glory and the praise in the body. I'm just a foot. I get dragged around in the dirt, and the body gets mad at me whenever I trip on a step. I may as well not even be part of the body. 
And because the foot feels that he's not a part of the body, does that make him not a part of the body? Well, what about the ear? He looks at the eye and he says, man, the eye really knows what's going on. He sees everything. He's at the front of the body, so he's got a more prominent location than I do. And everybody looks at the eye and he says to the body, wow, what beautiful eyes you have. I mean, they just look at me and they whisper, that guy has funny ears. Look how big they are. My body might as well just get rid of me. Nobody needs an ear. And we look at these illustrations and we say, that's crazy. Feet and ears are just as useful to us as hands and eyes. But in these illustrations, these body parts have convinced themselves that they are un necessary to the body. Now, when you have a problem with sickness in the body, you need to administer a cure or a remedy. And we're going to see that that remedy consists of three truths in this passage. So the first truth that you need to understand when you have feelings of uselessness in the body is that the subjective feeling of uselessness is invalid. It's false. See, look at verse 15 and verse 16. In both the case of the foot and the ear, Paul is literally saying, just because you feel like you're not part of the body, are you not a part of the body for that reason alone? Paul's point is that the subjective feeling of I do not belong has no validity alongside objective fact. See, it's not in fact the case that it does not belong just because it expresses its own doubts. And you and I know that the objective fact is that both feet and ears are extremely useful to the body. Now to move to the other side of the comparison that Paul is making in this passage from the human body to the body of Christ, how does this sickness creep into the body? Well, it happens when we move from admiring the sight given by an eye, or in our case, the eloquence of a teacher, as a wonderful gift And we move from that to the assumption that this is the only thing that really matters in the body of Christ. You see, our fallen nature can cause us to look around at all the other people in the church and say, wow, he's such a great speaker, or she's so gifted at running this ministry, or he can share the gospel so well. And we move from admiring God's gifting to a false conclusion that we don't belong in the body. And Paul is saying that such a subjective feeling has no validity alongside the objective fact that all limbs and organs contribute to the operation of the body. Feelings don't determine facts. All believers belong to the body, and therefore, you belong to. Now, the second truth in the remedy for feelings of uselessness is found throughout the passage, really. So look down first at verse 14 again. He says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And then look down at verses 19 and 20. If all were a single member... Where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So the second truth that you need to understand when you have feelings of uselessness is that the body needs diversity to function properly. Now I know it's ridiculous, but have you ever pictured in your mind 
what a body made up of only eyes would look like. Pretty creepy. We would call this a monster. It can't really do anything but stare you down. And it looks pretty hideous. Or maybe closer to what the passage is talking about here, have you ever considered how much good a hand could do if it were considered a whole body by itself? It would just lie there on the floor. It couldn't raise itself to shake another hand. It couldn't move with the precision to write or to type. It couldn't propel itself into motion to swing the bat that hit the walk-off home run in a baseball game. No, a body made up of just a hand is absolutely useless. And as ludicrous as these examples are to our minds, God thinks no differently of our perception that we are useless limbs or organs in the makeup of the body of Christ. Don't you see, he says, the man in the pulpit doesn't get the opportunity to preach the gospel without the people who staff the preschool so that they can free up parents to come and hear the living word of God without distraction. The message doesn't ring out with clarity and the Holy Spirit doesn't work in the hearts without the men and women who spend time on their knees praying for God to work in their church through the preaching of the Word. People don't fellowship in the Gospel as much as they could without the people who spend hours preparing food for us to enjoy. We don't pay attention in our gatherings on hot Sundays or frigid Sundays without those who invested their skills and their money to construct the building that we're meeting in today. Imagine doing this outside right now. We don't have pastors who can dedicate their time to teaching and preaching the Word of God if we don't have those who are faithful to give generously out of that with which God has blessed them. You see, the body of Christ is composed of a variety of limbs and organs because it takes diversity for a body to function properly. Have you ever thought about how useful your hand is in gripping things without your thumb? The thumb is so much different than the rest of your fingers. And if it weren't so, it would be much harder to do many of the things you do each and every day. The difference is what makes it valuable. Now, the final truth in the remedy for feelings of uselessness is found in verses 17 and 18. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. So the last thing you need to recognize when you have feelings of uselessness is that God is the good and wise designer of the body. See, if the whole, if the whole body were an eye, where would it get its sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would it get its sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members. Paul literally means that God so placed individuals into each local church in order to make each body function properly. He didn't just work with what he had and say, oh well, this is the best I can do with what I've got. He purposely chose the members of this assembly and their spiritual gifts to be here at this time to make this body work as it should. If you are here and you are a member of First Baptist Church, you aren't here on accident. It isn't by chance that we have the distinct makeup of people here that we do. God specifically placed you here. 
And notice how Paul clarifies in the next phrase, each one of them. This means that every single one of the people that belong to this assembly were placed here by God on purpose. What an awesome thought. See, if you belong to this church and you don't use the gifts and abilities that God has entrusted to you to serve and to build up this church, then we will never be a healthy and functioning body. Every believer here has a part to play in the healthy function of this church, carrying out the mission that God has given to us. See, God gives us the people and gifting that we need, but we need to be faithful to serve and to exercise those gifts. God is a good and wise designer to give this body of believers all the spiritual gifts that we need to accomplish his mission for us. But sometimes we encounter another problem in the body. And this sickness is just as heinous and perhaps even more so than the first one that we've talked about. So let's look down at verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. You see, the sickness that Paul is addressing here is feelings of self-sufficiency. The first sickness says, you don't need me. This sickness says, I don't need you. From time to time in the life of a church, it's very easy when we have disagreements to look at those with whom we disagree and say, we don't need them here. We think that they stand in the way of what needs to be done and we feel like we would be better off without them. Or sometimes we start to look at ourselves and say, my, what marvelous spiritual gifts I have. I am God's gift to this church. I don't really need anybody else to help me accomplish the work of the ministry. I'm quite capable by myself. Now this is the situation that Paul addresses in verse 21. So how does God feel about this mindset? Look down at verse 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. So Paul says... On the contrary, even more to the point would be the conclusion that those limbs and organs that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now Paul isn't saying that these are people who are frail or weak in the sense that they lack ability to do anything. He's referring to those who are less endowed with power or status in the church the people you would not think of immediately. This would be those people who aren't standing up and teaching and preaching and gaining all the attention in the church. Instead, they are ministering behind the scenes. The strong or gifted perceive them not as providing much effective weight or power in the church's mission. These people, Paul says, may seem to be expendable, But that is actually not the case. Here they are said to be indispensable or essential. So the negative warning that Paul gives to those who have feelings of self-sufficiency is, don't say, I don't need you. 
Don't say, we will do okay without these people. They aren't really that important to our church. On the contrary, those are people that God sovereignly placed here and whom God has equipped with spiritual gifts that you don't have so that you could be built up to do the ministry that you do. And Paul goes on to compare how with our human bodies, we have parts that we consider to be less presentable or less honorable. And we cover them up to give them modesty that our more presentable parts don't need. So how is the body of Christ like that? Well, look down at the end of verse 24. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. See, the picture Paul is giving here is of a painter who is mixing colors. God is mixing together the body of Christ in such a way that he gives honor and modesty to those limbs and organs that lack it. And God does this for a very specific purpose. Look down at verse 25 to see that purpose. That there, be, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. So the reason God is mixing together the body in that way that he does it is that there be no division. The idea here is that the limbs and organs not be torn apart from the body, but instead, God's purpose for the body is the opposite. That the members should have the same care for one another. See, the positive command that Paul gives to those who have feelings of self-sufficiency is this. Care for one another. See, the opposite of division in the body is not agreement on anything or on everything. That's never going to happen. The opposite is, I disagree with you, and I love you. And the disagreement in no way affects that love. This is one way that God gives honor to the parts that lack it through mutual care and concern in the body. See, there are lots of different people in our church, folks. Different backgrounds, different gifts, different personalities. Don't just spend time with people who are like you. The people who are very different from you have been placed here by God because you need them. You need their ministry in order for you to be built up and equipped to do your ministry. And they need you. Care for those who are different than you. And the end result of what happens when the body does this is found in verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. See, when we see an Olympic runner who breaks all the records in the book, we don't look at him and say, man, those are some amazing feet. Give those feet a medal. No, we praise the runner as a whole being. Not just his feet, because his accomplishment is a result of all of his members working together. And so it ought to be in the body of Christ. We shouldn't say, that church is magnificent, you should hear the preacher. Or that church has some fantastic musicians. But instead, we recognize that God has so placed us, each together in this local body. He has uniquely gifted each one of us to contribute to the ministry of First Baptist Church of Effingham. He has called us not to say to one another, I don't need you, 
but I love you even when we disagree. So let's ask ourselves some questions this morning. Do I ever find myself saying, I'm not necessary at this church? Because I don't feel like I can contribute like other people can. What are the spiritual gifts and talents that God has given to me, and how am I using them to contribute to the ministry of First Baptist Church? Do I ever say in my heart, I can handle the ministry without others? You know, maybe you're here this morning and you don't know what it means to follow Christ. You may have been in church all your life, or maybe this is your first time in church. Either way, just going to church won't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. You see, every one of us has sinned against God and deserves to be separated from him for all eternity in a place called hell. But the Bible tells us the good news of the gospel that God loves us so much that he sent his only perfect son, Jesus, to die in our place so that we could be reconciled to him. If we place our faith in Jesus alone, God credits us with Jesus' righteousness so that we can live forever with God. We can't do anything good to earn the salvation. We need to place all of our hope in Jesus to do it for us. If you've never done this, I would love to talk to you about it. Jesus is ready and willing to save you today. Perhaps it's time for some limbs and organs at First Baptist to recognize that they have been gifted by God to help this body function in the way that it's intended. Maybe some others of you have never decided to join the membership of this local church and you recognize that God is calling you to contribute as a limb or as an organ to this body. However God is leading you today, make sure that you respond to his calling. Let's pray together. God, we recognize that your word is powerful. We are not, but help us to be submissive to what your word calls us to. We may feel insignificant at times. We may feel like we don't have much to contribute. But we mustn't disrespect the working of your spirit to equip us with spiritual gifts that you want us to use for your glory. So I pray that our church would be faithful to do so. Help us to be responsive to you and obedient to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand.
you for your choosing to worship with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. As we close in prayer, we want to continue to pray for Rosie and Dennis Tucker. We mentioned last week that Dennis had fallen, uh, and he has been in the hospital now for a week. He's had some ups and downs. Uh, last night had a good night. We want to continue to praise the Lord for that, but to also continue to grant grace and strength for Dennis and for Rosie. So let's bow our heads and hearts together. Father, we thank you for your loving watch care over your people. We know that you love us more than we could possibly love one another, but you have called us to be channels of that love to one another in the body of Christ. So help us to do that. Help us to glorify you through showing your love to others. We pray for Dennis, and we pray that you continue to work in his body. We thank you for positive signs that he's seen, and we thank you for watching over and superintending in the circumstances that didn't seem as positive. We pray for Rosie, and we ask that you give strength to her as she continues to love and care for Dennis. We thank you for the privilege of modern medicine and for those who have cared for them. We pray for our church that you would give us the strength to be obedient to what you call us to do in your word. Sometimes you ask very hard things of us, and yet you always give us the strength to follow through. So help us to be obedient, we pray, that you might be glorified in us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, First Baptist, let's talk about what's going on at our church. Last week, we had a great time at our outdoor church-wide fellowship. We will be having one more fellowship in our back lot next Sunday night. Starting in the month of June, we will be having weekly fellowships like this at Bliss Park in order to get to know people in our community and to show love to them. Let me encourage you to begin praying now about these opportunities to connect with other people in our community. Now, you may have noticed that the prayer team has been organizing prayer for each of our worship gatherings right here at the front of the sanctuary each week. If you're interested in participating, we would love to have you. Please talk to Mike Verity or Mati Bartels. On June 6th, we will be having Vision Sunday, a special time when we will gather, sing worship to our great God, and talk about where we're headed as a church. We will have just one worship gathering that day at 10 a.m. Now, it will be a full service, and we will be streaming to the Fellowship Hall to those who want to spread out more. I'm excited about the opportunity that we will have to gather together to hear from the Word of God. Because the worship gathering will be at 10 a.m., our Sunday school will be at 9 a.m., and that will also be Promotion Sunday. Finally, if you're new here at First Baptist, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I would love to meet you as you leave today. Have a great week, First Baptist.